wanted to formally welcome everybody who's joined us either on the Zoom call right now or on our YouTube live stream. We're excited to have you with us today for how to get a rocket to Mars. Um, before I turn things over to our excellent AmeriCorps educator, I just wanted to run through a few things that you'll notice. On Zoom, if you're in Zoom, you can actually take part in today's call by either chatting with us. You'll see I've already posted a message in our little chat window. That's a button at the bottom of your screen. If you go to the left of it, you'll see one that says Q&A, and you can pose questions in there, and our educator, Hannah, will be answering those questions either live during today's session or in written form. And if you're worried about preserving your identity, you can even post them anonymously in there as well by just toggling the little drop-down menu. And then finally, if you're in Zoom as well, you can raise your hand at the bottom of your screen. And using that raise your hand function, I'll get pinged, and then I'll send you a message to share your video and your audio, and that way you'll be able to interact live with Hannah in today's session. Of course, you should remember that today's session is being recorded and we will be posting it on our website for um, future audience members. So tell your family or your loved ones or your colleagues or friends to check out our archives there if they missed any of our classes that they had wanted to join. And if you're on YouTube today on our live stream, you'll notice of course that you have a chat on YouTube itself. And so please feel free to ask your questions in there and I will pose them for Hannah as well. So without further ado, I wanna introduce you to Hannah Buckner who will be teaching today's class and welcome again, everyone. Great. Well, thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. I know this is um, definitely an interesting topic that um, I got a lot of questions about in our last class that we did for astronomy. Um, so I'm very welcome, well, I'm very happy that you're here and um, let's get started. So um, I do just wanna let you know that um, when I will be um, showing how certain things work or um, taking notes on my whiteboard screen. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of a delay, so I will be doing my best to make sure that things go smoothly. Um, and with that, um, let's get started. Um, so I'm going to share my screen um, just to have this open. Great, or actually no, I, I won't do that yet. So let's get started. So um, I wanted to start off talking a little bit about physics and forces. So physics is kind of what allows us to be able to ask the question of how do we even get to Mars? So um, physics is the study of matter, energy, and the interaction between them. Um, Physics is the field where physicists and astronomers and sometimes engineers ask really big questions like, how did the universe start? Um, why is it that um, on Earth things fall straight down, but when you're in outer space, why is it that we can float? Um, does anti-gravity really exist? Um, what are the foundations of matter and how have they changed over time? Um, so it's questions like this that has led us to be able to have this discussion about how do we get a rocket into space? How is it that we can even get to Mars? Is it even possible? Um, and most of all, are we gonna be able to live on Mars? Um, so before we get to that, um, I want to also address what forces are. So in physics, we talk about the interactions between things. And so one of the biggest things there is that um, we, ha we have, um, we talk about motion in terms of forces. So what is a force? A force is a push or pull on an object um, that can come from its interaction with another object or an outside source. So um, typically we see things like friction, gravity, thrust, um, we have um, electrons and their interactions with each other and they have those push and pull effects. Um, we also have things like electricity, that's also a force. Um, but what we're gonna really focus on today are 
um, gravity and thrust. Um, you may also hear me talk about um, forces like drag and lift, but we're not really gonna focus on them, so um, I'm not gonna discuss about what they are. Um, so when we talk about gravity um, and where we are on Earth, there's a common misconception about weight versus mass. Um, so one way that we discovered the effect of gravity on Earth is our weight. Um, scientists have figured out that weight isn't actually the um, what we think we are. So, <laughs> um, oh, Drew, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine, Hannah. Okay, thanks. I don't know why Greg can't hear me. Okay. Um, so oh, when we wait, have wait weight, to Greg. Okay. Um, so when we have weight on Earth, it's actually not like well, when we talk about how much we weigh in pounds that isn't just taking into account the mass of our bodies. It's actually taking into account the force of gravity that we feel on Earth. So um, when, <laughs> when you are looking at your weight, typically um, in a majority of the world, actually, they look in terms of kilograms. And that can um, allow us to really see the difference between someone's mass and their weight on Earth. So I believe um, the force of gravity is about, um, well, the, 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 never mind, I was going to do math conversions, but we're not going to do math today. Um, so gravity, I've said it so many times, but what is it really? Gravity is the force which um, objects or bodies can attract other objects or bodies towards its center. So um, that's actually what's keeping us on Earth. Um, when we jump up, we come down. And that's because the force of gravity on Earth is very strong. Um, Earth is way more massive than us. So um, when we are jumping up into the air, we can slightly escape it, but then gravity will pull us back down. And actually, when because we're talking about an interaction between things, um, where we draw each other towards each other, um, actually, when we do jump, the Earth kind of follow us, follows us a little bit. But because Earth is stronger, we come back down. Um, so um, that is gravity. Um, gravity, um, just so we can understand how big it is um, or strong it is, it is. Um, us scientists and physicists say it's about um, negative 10 meters per second squared, um, which seems like a lot in terms of a number, but it's really not a lot. Um, I also mentioned thrust, um, and in terms of a rocket that is really what helps it move up. Um, so when we have thrust, um, and this is where I'm going to do a whiteboard. Um, it might take a moment. Um, there we go. Um, so a rocket has So it's still just connecting on our end, Hannah, if you want to give it a second. Okay. You can yeah. talk about the idea though, of course. Right, so when you have a rocket, there's gonna be different interactions on the rocket to get it to move. So um, please excuse my really bad drawing skills. Um, but when you have a rocket, um, it has to face a few different interactions, such as gravity, friction, um, it uses lift and drag um, to, well, 
it feels drag, but then lift helps it move up. But when you have thrust, it's actually what's helping it move. So when an object like a rocket or maybe even a plane experiences thrust, it actually comes out in the form of energy on the bottom of the rocket. Um, I'm not seeing it showing up, but just imagine um, at the bottom of a rocket, there's fire coming out um, and that's being brought by fuel. Um, when we see rockets going up into space, we're seeing them going all the way up and we hear the roaring of the fuel being burned as it's being pushed up. That's experiencing the thrust. Um, so thrust, it takes into account um, some liquid um, stuff that we talk about in physics um, that kind of just tells us how fast the fuel is moving. Um, we also take into account the pressure or the amount of squeezing that there is of gas or liquid in the um, rocket and the fuel tank, the speed of the rocket, and as well as the area of the cone where the um, where all the fuel is coming out. Um, so thrust really can allow something to move. And that's actually how we're able to get a rocket off of Earth and into the atmosphere. And when we're in the atmosphere, we have to actually fight gravity um, of, well, Earth's gravity, plus the friction of the atmosphere. So you had one question, Hannah. And this is maybe unrelated, but somebody anonymously asked, when will beetle geese explode? Beetle <laughs> juice. Beetle goose, sorry. Um, so we don't actually know when beetle juice is going to, um, well, it's, it's not really going to explode. Um, what's going to happen is that um, beetle juice is actually burning up the, the last of its hydrogen fuel. Um, kind of like how we have a rocket that has fuel that lets it get into space. So as, it's, as a star burns through its hydrogen fuel, it creates more elements like helium, um, oxygen, iron. And as it keeps burning through its fuel, sorry, there is a fly in here. Um, <laughs> it creates heavier elements and as it gets heavier, um, it actually becomes unstable. And so um, Betelgeuse is um, really massive. It's come towards the end of its life and it has all these heavy elements in it that are starting to have nowhere to go and there's all this energy being built up. So we're seeing that it's expanding. So it was like this and now it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, what's going to happen is that it's actually going to collapse um, because it will no longer have the ability to sustain energy um, and keep itself running. So it's going to collapse and then it'll, it will move back out because it'll have all this energy inside and that will create a supernova. So it will kind of explode but not really. Um, we don't really know when it's going to happen. Um, I read recently that we've been seeing fluctuations um, or changes in the amount of light that's being received. So um, it could be soon that we're gonna see it, but because Betelgeuse is so far away um, and the way that we measure distance in space um, has to do with light. So um, one light year, is the, is the amount of time that light travels a certain distance. Um, so, because if, we're, if we look at the, if we look at the sun, um, we know that um, because of the way light travels, it takes about eight minutes for the light from the sun to reach us at, on its surface. So the light that we're actually seeing from the sun isn't happening now, it's actually eight minutes prior. So we're seeing the light as it was eight minutes ago. 
So when we're looking at Betelgeuse, um, um, let's see, how far is Betelgeuse? Um, so Betelgeuse is about 642.5 light years away. So that means it takes about 640, well, it doesn't take about, it takes exactly 642.5 years for the light from, to reach us from Betelgeuse. So as we're seeing it, we're actually looking into the past as Betelgeuse looked 642.5 years ago. So it could have exploded, but we wouldn't know that yet because it, the light hasn't reached us. Um, it may not have exploded yet. Um, it could happen any day for us. It probably already happened in the past. Um, so there's really no right answer for that. It's just an estimate, a guess. Our best guess is that it could happen in a week. It could happen in a month, in a year. We just don't know. Um, yeah, but if you actually follow on Twitter, um, if you have a Twitter account or access to it, um, there are tons of astrophysicists who are um, following Betelgeuse, um, making sure that if something does happen to it, that they are ready to know. Um, my personal favorite um, that I like to follow, I'll give a shout out to her. Her name is Serafina Nance. Um, you can follow her at, at stricken, star stricken SF. Um, she's been following supernovae and um, stars like Betelgeuse, so um, she'll be one of the first people probably to know about that. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a long answer for I don't know. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, I think it, it's a lot of great information for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, getting to um, going to Mars, um, well, getting a rocket to space to get to Mars. Um, so like I said, we need gravity and we need thrust and we need to get out of the atmosphere. So we take all of these things into consideration um, and um, that's why when, we, when you hear stories about um, there being issues with um, a fuselage, or um, there not being enough um, gas due to a leak or something, um, that's actually really important to get a rocket into space because the amount of friction or um, rubbing that the uh, rocket is going to be feeling in the atmosphere is going to be a lot. And it's gonna be fighting this, it's gonna be like a tug of war fight between a rocket and Earth and so it's going to really have to fight to get out of the atmosphere. So um, we have to really take into consideration the weight of the rocket. We have to um, account for the fuel it's going to have, anything that's going to be on board. Usually when we have a rocket and we're sending it to the International Space Station, there's going to be um, a, um, I forget the actual term for it, but when they have an amount of food, supplies, um, things that they really want to test, they send it up in that. Yes. So you, you have a question from YouTube, um, and it is Teresa asking, could a rocket explode in Mars atmosphere if we were theoretically sending one there? That's a good question. Um, so... I was going to talk about Mars's atmosphere later, actually, but um, I don't believe that the atmosphere would cause an explosion. It's completely possible for a rocket to explode at any point in time, um, which is why when we send people up to the International Space Station, they are taking a really big risk because they could die on their way to doing um, research or that's also why we call them heroes. Um, but at, Mars has a very thin atmosphere. Um, so it doesn't really feel the same force of gravity that they would be feeling on Earth. Um, actually, um, one thing to really know is that weight is completely different on Mars. So um, if you were to weigh 100 pounds on Earth, you would actually only weigh 38 pounds on Mars. 
So um, there's a very big difference between um, the force of gravity. It's much lighter on Mars. Um, because Mars is also significantly smaller than Earth. Um, I believe, okay, so Earth is about 8,000 miles across. Um, Mars is about half that. So it's 50% 50, 50 less in size than Earth is. Um, so we really wouldn't have to worry about something like the atmosphere creating friction or something. Um, that's actually part of the reason why that um, a lot of the heat doesn't really stay on Mars is because the atmosphere isn't very strong. I hope that answers your question. Um, so that's how it is getting into space. Um, once we actually get to space, um, there are a few things that have to happen in order to actually get to Mars. Um, one thing that I mentioned before is that um, when we have individuals in space and we have rockets in space, um, things start to float around. And that floating isn't necessarily that there's an absence of gravity, it's actually that um, once you get into space and you're moving around in Earth's orbit, um, you're actually free falling in space. So um, kind of like when people are skydiving from any altitude and they're falling down, they're doing the same thing in space. It's just they're moving in a, in a specific way, um, like satellites, and they're falling through the atmosphere, but maintaining a specific speed where they don't actually fall into the atmosphere. Um, so when we're moving in space, um, you kind of need to be able to figure out a way where you can keep moving in um, a way that doesn't actually waste your fuel. Um, because you could spend, you know, a specific way to get to the moon. You could go straight out or um, you could use a planet like the slingshot, which brings me to my next point. Um, when we get to um, a place like Mar like the moon or Mars, um, they are quite a big difference in space. Um, the way that we measure distance in, in astronomy and astrophysics is in astronomical units. So um, that distance is, I believe, um, uh, maybe 120 million miles, um, which is a lot. Um, it's hard to really grasp that distance. Um, and it also makes doing the calculations very annoying because that's a lot of zeros. So um, we've found that using astronomical units is significantly easier because it's less numbers. Um, so right now, the distance between Earth and Mars is 1.5 astronomical units or 139.73 million miles away. Um, but because they don't move in perfect circles, um, the distance can actually be up to 250 million miles, which is 2.67 astronomical units, um, which really makes trying to fly somewhere very important. Um, because you want you want to use less fuel and conserve it. So when you want to fly somewhere, you kind of want to make sure that they're going to be pretty close to each other. Um, so it takes timing, really well thought out planning, um, but a really excellent way to get somewhere in space is actually to use a planet as a slingshot. So um, what we actually see. Um, we see this on every scale. Um, when we send um, supplies and people up to the International Space Station, um, they don't actually fly right up to the International Space Station. They move in um, such a way that it is actually pretty cool. It takes uh, like three days to get up to the International Space Station, um, which is crazy because it's like right above the, the atmosphere. Um, 
what they're actually doing is they are, let me do this. They are traveling around the earth in a circle. So they're moving like this and as they get each round, they're actually flying further and further away so they can reach the point like the International Space Station. Um, so we use that for International Space Station, but when we were going to the moon, um, they would do the same thing, but do a slightly different orbit path. So they would actually be, be going much further. So if this is Earth, they would start off, they'd fly out, and they'd be flying at an angle, which sends them like this. Sorry, I'm gonna do it like this. And it gets bigger and bigger, and soon they can fly out of Earth's orbit and fly to the moon. And then they would have the same thing where they fly, they, <laughs> using the same things. Um, as they're coming into the moon, this is the moon now, they'd be flying in a way where they can do the same thing. So they land. Um, and it's easier to do that with the moon than it is Mars because the moon is so much closer to us. Um, and they don't have to really worry about having enough fuel because it only takes about maybe like a couple weeks. Um, but when we get to Mars, it's a little bit different. Um, the travel time to Mars is very long. Um, it's about nine months. Um, and that's if you're going to the shortest distance. So as you're flying to Mars, um, you really need to be traveling at a, a, at a decent speed and trying to saving uh, trying to save as much fuel as possible. Um, and you want to get that perfect landing that we just talked about with the um, the way that you lift off, fly, and then land. Um, so the the dis the difference um, between what we've we've seen here on Earth and with Mars, I'm sure that you've seen um, some videos of companies like SpaceX or Tesla um, or doing Dragon. Um, they've been practicing self-landing rockets. Um, that is actually really cool. Um, so what they do is they have their rockets trying to maneuver through the atmosphere, coming back down and landing in terms of their um, environment. So if they're landing on water, you know, being able to balance that. Um, with Mars, it's different because obviously, like we were saying before, the atmosphere is slightly significantly different. It's much lighter. Um, so they don't have to worry as much about um, the actual landing, but um, it can also be pretty um, difficult if you're not landing in a flat area. So that's kind of important, trying to find the right place to land. Um, luckily, we have rocket, we have um, robots on Mars that can help us with that. Yes, Drew. Yeah, we have uh, another question from Teresa. And this one is um, focused on how would we actually land on Mars? So right now she notes when we land rovers, they bounce for a while until they stop. Um, she's, I think, worrying about whether human beings would be safe doing that and you know, how, how we would approach a landing on the actual surface of the planet. That's, that's actually a really good point. Um, so we are aware right now with um, landing on Earth too, when people come back from the International Space Station, that there is a bounce. And so we do prepare our astronauts for that. Um, there would be a slight bounce with um, Mars, like we've seen with the rockets. Um, it's possible that the bounce could be bigger um, because the rocket would be, be carrying people, not rockets. I'm um, not rockets, robots. <laughs> they sound so similar. Um, so um, the way I'm imagining it would be that um, a rocket would come down with probably um, still not stilts, but like feet. It would come down and it would bounce. Um, so um, 
it is definitely something that they do have to take in consideration when they're um, building the technology and the um, the quarters for the crew. Um, but they definitely do take in um, preparedness for that. So there's got to be cushioning. Um, I'm sure with the spacesuits that they're designing that they allow for um, extra mobility. Um, we have seen some the spacesuits that have been designed where it gives um, astronauts um, full mobility of their arms so they can move them up and down like this. They can't do that in, spa um, in the spacesuits that they have now. Um, and um, they're not gonna be as heavy, which is gonna create um, some easier time moving around in their, um, in their cabin, um, which is like where they'll be in the rocket itself. Um, but beyond that, I'm not completely sure. We haven't really seen something of that size. Um, I would imagine if you're seeing um, how the robots landing have occurred, I would imagine it'd be very similar. Um, we see that too here, like I said, um, when um, astronauts come back down to Earth from the International Space Station, um, they land in water. Um, and sometimes it um, bounces a few times in the water before it like floats. Um, and it's a very bumpy ride, but um, their astronauts are prepared for that. Um, and they're trained for it as well. That was really good timing. Um, so yeah, once we've landed on Mars, um, we have to set up some camps. So, um, I imagine this would take place over the course of many months, um, sending more um, things to get to Mars um, because we cannot fit an entire, um, what is it called, like um, facilities in, within one rocket. It, it would take um, building over the course of time, many, many years, um, to build up a, a whole place for people to be living. Um, yeah, so um, living on Mars has to take into account the atmosphere, um, the fact that there's no oxygen on the planet, um, as well as the temperatures. So um, the rocket itself, um, in addition to the quarters that the astronauts would be using, has to be able to sustain temperatures on Mars that are pretty extreme. So Mars can experience ranges between um, 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is pretty comfortable, um, but it can go down to being negative 284 degrees, which is very cold. And I'm talking about Fahrenheit here um, with, um, the average temperature on Mars is negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, we would have to be able to sustain um, things that could keep things that could keep the rock, um, astronauts alive would have to be able to endure such extreme temperatures and wear and tear um, that it could allow people to live on Mars. Um, so those are, it's very important that um, going to Mars would have all of the preparedness necessary and backups um, because it would be having the orbit around Earth and then um, there's the idea of having a way station on the moon which would allow for um, refueling um, and being able to rest and take off again, um, using that again as a slingshot, and then moving through space for nine months, um, and then going through the motions of landing on Mars, which would take probably about two to three days, um, and then landing and then living in the extreme environment. Um, and there's a lot of things that would have to be done um, to make it livable. Um, 
we don't have all the answers for that yet, but um, I can definitely answer those questions once we've gotten to the end. Um, so I do want to um, kind of state, why haven't we gone to Mars yet? I know this is a very common question um, because we've had this ability to go to space for so, so long. Um, it's been something we've been looking at for a very long time, but it never really became possible up until now to really say logically and realistically, let's go there. So um, as you may remember, I said before, timing is everything. Um, one thing I do want to show, I have to share this um, for you guys to see. Um, where did it go? Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, ooh, that's better. Okay. Share screen. That's all about Mars. Great. Okay. So you guys should be seeing um, a website made by Mar um, NASA. Um, it's called um, the Mars Exploration Program. And so it has all these like information about Mars, um, its moons, and how we see Mars. Um, we can actually move the planet around, which is really cool. You can see that Mars has ice caps, um, which tells us that there is um, some form of water on the planet. So there's the North and the South Pole, which is right here. Um, so like I said, timing is everything. Um, Mars is quite distant from Earth. So this is what I really wanted to talk about. Um, so we have 93 million miles between the sun and the Earth. And then this is showing 142 million miles um, this way. So um, it, this doesn't look very far, but um, it is quite a distance. Um, so this means that in this terms of um, their orbits, they're actually pretty close over here, but um, because Earth is moving at a different speed than um, Mars, as you're seeing here, um, Mars actually has a year that is almost as twice as long as um, the Earth. So they're moving at very different um, speeds. Um, oh, I wish they, I didn't think they, okay. Um, so when we're looking at timing, we have to be able to estimate um, and calculate, not just a guess, but we calculate when Earth and Mars are gonna be very close to each other. We also call this, um, I think this is called conjunction. Um, when they are very close to each other is when we really would want to get our rocket and our team out to um, out the atmosphere, out of our atmosphere and towards Mars. Um, if we were to do it in, um, at a time where we wouldn't have um, this distance, it could take so long and our, our rocket could lose fuel if there's not enough oxygen on the, um, if there's not enough oxygen on the, um, on the, <laughs> sorry, on the rocket, um, the, the astronauts could die. And so we really don't wanna be worrying about that. Um, because that distance is so vast, um, we have to make sure we have enough fuel. Um, as of right now, we don't have a station between Earth and Mars um, besides the International Space Station, but um, that can only hold so much fuel and supplies. Um, so that's not really a logical way for them to stop. Um, so we need to make sure that there's enough fuel to get them going there and possibly come back. But as of right now, um, with the Mars program that they have right now where they've been asking for astronauts to volunteer to go and create a colony on Mars, um, they would not be able to come back home because there's not enough fuel for them um, to have a round trip. There's only one way. Um, so it's something that we have to be able to think about. Um, are we willing to 
risk one our lives um, to be able to travel um, for nine months at least to get to a planet where we would no longer see our family. Um, we would be stuck with those people for the rest of our lives, um, possibly, until we develop the ability to have travel back and forth um, because fuel is very important. Um, if there was a way to capture sunlight, I'm sure that would be very helpful um, instead of just having gas and oil um, or diesel, I guess is what they use. Um, it's just not something that has really been effective in terms of getting um, rockets that far um, and coming back, um, I guess, to lift off. Um, and yeah, we'd want to be able to make sure that um, the humans on the ship could sustain the travel time and living. Yes. So um, a question about sorry, on the topic of fuel. You. Um, can you hear me, Hannah? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, uh, a question on the topic of fuel. Just uh, wondering, you know, how do they, how are they able to have, I think the question was, how are they able to have all of that fuel sto stored on a rocket? Does it mean that, that the rocket is mostly fuel or is it just a little part of the rocket? Or, you know, how, how do you plan for that kind of long of a voyage? Yeah, so, um, there are many parts to a rocket, um, and a lot of it is actually having to do with fuel. So um, the way that they work now is that there are various parts. Let's see if I can actually pull this up. Um, parts of a rocket. Um, this might be a good one. Right, okay. So as we're seeing in this rocket, I wonder if I can, oh, I can, great. Um, I want to do spotlight, okay. No, that's not what I wanted, great. Sorry guys, learning here. Um, I, what's this? Okay, great. So can you see my, um, my thing, Drew? Oh, uh, yeah, okay, great. Um, we will go back to this picture and just, sorry guys. Okay, so what we're seeing here is there's the nose cone and the payload section. So this right here is where all the payload, which is the supplies and people are, well, they're in the nose cone section. Um, so all of the rest of this body <laughs> contains um, the things like fuel, um, the ability to um, really get them into space. Um, so these aren't showing like actual rockets, but um, we will do NASA rocket parts. So, right, okay. So what we're seeing here is the old picture of the orbiter, um, which was the space shuttle that they used to have and no longer used because it ran its time. It had too much wear and tear to keep using. So what we're seeing here um, is the old way of doing um, travel into space. So um, you have um, the engine here for um, fuel and a good portion of this would, would have um, fuel to use to get back from space, um, which was very, very smart of them. Um, but these tanks here were um, to help the rocket get into space. So um, there are stages where um, rockets would be released. Um, I haven't studied rocket science, so I don't really know the order of how they do it, um, but they have phases where um, 
I guess the boosters would go first and then the external tank would fall or I think it's the external tank goes first and then the boosters which are these white um, parts of the um, the rocket um, they would fall off last and then the the shuttle would move itself so um, my guess is that they would be moving like this um, but I don't know what the amount of fuel they'd be using and like where they'd be storing it, but I imagine it'd be very similar to this. Um, you can also look up um, Dragon. Um, I think that's through SpaceX. I could be very wrong, um, but SpaceX also has a good list of um, how they want to um, put together their rocket um, there was a whole program that um, NASA was doing to ask for um, people to, um, well, not people, for companies to be able to um, put up a, um, um, put up what they want a rocket to be like, and it may be their opportunity to, um, may be their opportunity to get their rocket to go to space. So um, that's what it's really going to look like. So that is how much fuel will be kept in. It just depends on the rocket that they're using and how much space they've dedicated to that. So does anybody have any questions about rockets, living in Mars, living in space, traveling? all that so one question from youtube um we have somebody asking they're, they're not thinking as much about getting the rockets there but getting all the materials there right if we were going to build some kind of colony or i guess you could say the next planet this sounds a little bit like some um different books or movies you may have read or seen uh <laughs> but but just wondering you know how would that work would it mean like multiple rockets would it mean you know, specialized rockets or yeah. that bring certain things or maybe are ro robotics. So just wondering yeah, what you think so, about that. Yeah. Um, what I have been reading and what I've been hearing is that um, some of the plans are that they be sending um, supplies out in waves. So um, once they have the specific, um, I guess you would call um, the first um, people who are going to be coming for the colony. Um, I don't know if they're going to be sending everybody out all at once. Um, that's kind of classified information for them. Um, <laughs> not, not for us public people. Um, they would probably be doing it out in waves where they'd be sending kind of like the essentials um, to keep their people alive for some time. Um, before the next supplies could come, and they would probably have um, a very basic, um, uh, like, station builds supply on their ship. Um, I imagine if it's going to be a nine months trip, it's going to be a pretty big rocket um, because that does require a lot of fuel, a lot of um, supplies. So, um, probably more than what we've seen. Um, for um, payloads that are going up to the International Space Station. Um, um, so it does take many trips. Um, I imagine that um, they would probably be sending up majority of um, supplies for food right away and then just building the rest of their station on Mars and then um, once they have the ability to self-sustain, then they could, or before they can self-sustain, um, sending up, um, you know, supplies for farming in space. We've started to see that be possible on the International Space Station. There's space lettuce. Um, that looks really cool. Um, it's very purple. Um, <laughs> Um, so I imagine it's going to be something very similar to that. Um, if you're interested in how they could be um, 
getting things to Mars. Um, there's been some, there's been a couple of movies that I'm aware of about um, having um, colonists on Mars. So one of them is The Martian, um, and they talk about um, how food may be grown on Mars um, and kind of talks about them having their station and their ship. Um, of course, remember that it's not necessarily accurate. Um, it's just um, I, an idea of what could be happening in the future. Um, that's also a very good, that's a very good movie. Um, then the other one is, um, this one isn't really science, it's science fiction, but it's more based about a love story, but um, it's also a good movie just to watch to see um, how they've gotten to Mars. It's called The Space Between Us. Um, and it's about how um, these first colonists were going to Mars. Um, one of them ends up being pregnant and has a child that is born on Mars. So it's actually an interesting um, movie about how space can actually impact um, human growth, which is really cool too, um, because we have seen the effects of space on human growth already without them being young. We've seen people have their DNA changed. Um, eyesight gets a little bit worse. You have to keep up with um, workout regimen. Um, so it's definitely something interesting to see from that perspective, but it also shows um, life, how they get from their payload to Mars. Yes. So I was just gonna add um, one writer that our audience out there might be interested in is Kim Stanley Robinson, and he's written a Mars trilogy, starting with Red Mars, and then Blue Mars and Green Mars. So a related question from somebody on YouTube is, what are the steps we need to do to actually be able to live there? Right, so um, if we want to just have a colony on Mars, um, we obviously need to be able to get um, supplies to the planet to be able to build a facility that can sustain people um, and continue to hold growth um, inside um, and study what um, the atmosphere really is like for someone living on Mars and um, other things that they may want to figure out um, and then be able to figure out a way to sustain um, ways of growing food and um, recycling water and generating water if that's possible. Um, the next step would be to terraform. Um, so that means when you take basically a dead planet um, like Mars that doesn't really have um, life on it. We want to be able to grow plants and if we have plants, um, they don't really require oxygen. Um, I believe there are levels of nitrogen and carbon dioxide, or maybe it's carbon monoxide, on Mars. Actually, if we go to this, um, well, me because I can see it. So right, okay. Let me let me share this because you guys will find this very interesting. Um, so on Mars, um, we actually see what the atmosphere is composed of. So um, there is no oxygen on Mars. So we would really need um, to be able to develop that. But what we're seeing here is that there's 96% carbon dioxide, which is really good if we're able to plant um, things like trees, um, vegetables, just plant life. Um, they could take that carbon dioxide and convert into oxygen, which would then um, over time build um, if the atmosphere can thicken. Because we are seeing that um, based on this fact sheet that um, Earth's atmosphere is 100 times denser than Mars. So it would take a lot of um, time to be able to see if this would grow and thicken. Um, it's kind of tricky. Um, we've obviously never done terraforming. Um, it's been a lot in um, shows like Star Trek, um, Star Wars. Um, there's also a game called Terra 
platform, I think. Um, I tried it one time and it was actually really cool. You can terraform many planets. The first one you can do is either Mars or the moon. And it really teaches you about what's really important in order to um, get life to form. You have to really watch the temperature of the planet, um, see how thick the atmosphere is and be able to have water form and it be clean water, not um, toxic water. Um, and be able to have levels of oxygen that aren't you know, too much because we're seeing that Earth is 78% um, nitrogen and 21% oxygen. So we really don't need all that much, much oxygen to live. Um, nitrogen is very important. Um, we need nitrogen in our blood. Um, and actually nitrogen is the reason why our planet seems blue because that appears blue when um, light scatters through it um, on an atomic level. So, um, yeah, we have to be able to um, sustain um, an atmosphere, be able to have some oxygen levels. Um, that's all kind of theory. Um, just gotta take what you read and look up from my personal favorite is Star Trek, because um, I do talk about terraforming in many episodes in The Next Generation, um, which is really cool. Um, but there's also like the Martian and um, the space between us where they do talk about terraforming. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, and on that note, I just wanted to thank everybody who has come here to join us today for how do you get a rocket to Mars. And I, of course, want to thank our excellent presenter, Hannah Buckner, our AmeriCorps service member. And of course, I just want to remind everybody that the museum is doing many things to engage with you online. So make sure you check out fairbanksmuseum.org. The front page has a lot of good information. You can also check out our Facebook page. And if you're looking specifically for virtual learning like today's session, you can go to the learn menu option and a drop down item on it is actually our virtual learning. So thank you once again, everybody for joining us for this early Friday morning class. And thank you, Hannah, for leading us in our exploration of how we might one day go to Mars. Have and a great day, everyone.